the soundscape uh, as a way to uh, shift, make a change from the earlier roots of ecology, stemming out of the 60s after the Vietnam War. It had, from the beginning, um, it started on a mood of grievance. Our, our whole movement of ecology is built on a mood of grievance. And so for me, I have a need to shift my experience when I look at systems and totalities and interrelationships um, away from that mood of grievance. Grief is a, has been a big theme for me. And this summer, I had huge respiratory problems. And I had uh, for two and a half months, I couldn't speak because I was just go into a coughing fit that would make me vomit. That's how, how much the, uh, my lungs were so sensitive. Uh, this is my fourth month now. Um, I may not make it through continuously without coughing, but I'm much better. Uh, but I have, I have big lung issues. As I was trying to figure out what am I going to talk about this year, I couldn't go outside of my immediate experience trying to get breath. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I was in bed for six weeks, really not even able to eat, let alone just, just trying to breathe. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so this, this is my experience. I have no conclusions or destinations, and like Lisa says, it's um, it's an encounter. It's not I'm not a discover anything. I'm just encountering the experience. Mm -hmm. So there it goes. Oh, and I do have a little. I did. I did. Originally, I wanted to put in a soundscape because that's really where I'm. My own research of my experience of nature is moving into sound, and and it's extraordinary. If you don't know about it, go Google it because they are making so many. Scientific um, discoveries of seas between the North Pole and the equator of all the life echoing each other back and forth and, and, and imitating and creating these concerts that we have up till now no awareness of the, of the sing song totality and the complexity through sound. So. <clears throat> in excess of being, a phenomenological practice of nature. It is summer in Florida. Warm air sticks to my skin. And yet, I feel it come to me, choke quick cold, as a dry, windy spotlight shining into a dark hole. Shut it out, the throat tightens, Stay still. Take just enough. Take just a bit more than you are. A small excess. Spilling over pure homeostasis. Or we must upset that perfect stillness to survive. Breathing is not something the average mortal can make a choice about. It's more likely that the atmosphere breathes us, working like a pivotal point, igniting materials on body. My effort these days is tolerating the irritation of breath coming in, and then mustering some will to exhale without engaging a suffocating component. I can slow down the pace, make air creep in very widely, through the nose, and maybe through the ears, more difficult through the mouth. Tasting the air, distinguishing, distinguishing the limit as the point of absolute necessity. Because there is no definite line where breath starts and where it stops. Where air begins without us, at what point do we even separate? Mm -hmm. Nobody can voluntarily suffocate themselves, go into fatal oxygen deprivation, because if you hold your breath long enough, you will eventually lose consciousness. And once unconscious, 
the autonomic function of the body will start up again, and the breath resumes, the twisting and turning, the whole movement of the atmosphere shaping itself through the body lives again. This is what I understand to be nature, an organizing principle that works into the material of the earth, and from the material of the earth back into the atmosphere. I am interested in asking what new way materiality can participate in a synthesis of our concept of nature as both an ontological problem and as an epistemological one. Because right now, in, this, in, in, the, in the conversation of, of, of ecology, the field is separated. <coughs> to do so, I am experimenting with the concept of nature in the way Johann von Goethe described in the 19th century as, quote, the pregnant point from which a series of physical phenomena governs itself from within outward. Even more, I am interested in how physical phenomena affect our concepts as well as things of the earth out to the limits of the sky, because they both retain this potentiality and they are relation. I take as the subject of study my own breath in a debilitated state as it relates to the totality of my immediate surrounding atmosphere. Obstruction always draws conscious attention. When something critical breaks down, we are present with full focus out of necessity to restore its function. And in the process, a new experience arises. As eco-critic and experimental poet Jonathan Skinner writes, quote, form emerges when we make our own limitations available as a contact site for something else, as a communication interface through practices of blockage as connection. There is something that moves, even when it improves. Illness shows us we have a body that is grounded in physicality, that must abide by certain principles in association with what is natural. Specifically, by way of our breath, we are constantly connected to what harbors all life potential. This is partly illustrated by a passage from Lawrence Van der Post. <coughs> The Lost World of the Kalahari. Quote, On a hot day in the southern desert of Africa, I had wanted to go and speak to one of my favorite hunters. Sitting in the middle of a thorn bush, he was huddled in the attitude of the most intense concentration. But his friends would not let me go near him, saying, but don't you know he is doing work of the utmost importance? He is making clouds. <coughs> Even though highly frightened by Van der Post's Jungian education and skewed by his own literary exaggerations, even if these conversations with men of the Kalahari never occurred, the scenario describes a critical phenomenon. When Gebser speaks generally about nature from the 20th century, he is talking about our intensifying relationship to the matter of our survival. And he is explaining our changing ways of communicating through that survival in archaeological time. He describes the intensification of our consciousness as nature's organic gestation of the seed cycle, insinuating there is an inherent link between processes of biological life on Earth and human awareness. The germ of human life, and for our purposes today we are focused on breath, begins with the intimate correspondence between Gebser's idea of soul and nature, one that obfuscates spatial awareness and internalizes time in spaces. Here, in this nowhere, Gebser writes, quote, there arises the germ of need, no longer of being in the world, but of having the world wherein we try to 
free the self from the transcendent power of illusion. Thus, a magic reaction happens, as if in a laboratory, that Gebster says, is struck by the striving of our soul to materialize within us and become conscious of itself. And in this way, nature gives us the capacity for consciousness. Eventually, the psychic release from the physical enmeshment with the materiality of nature is what also engages our tragic drive for power and creates a fear compelling to rule the outside world so as not to be ruled by it. Yet, in the process, the transcendent power of nature as potentiality transforms. Liking to hide, nature works its impulses in the creation of soul as an interiorized phenomenon of meter or rhythmic sway between polarities, a kind of breath informed by the diurnal cycle. Nature, thus interiorized, becomes temporal through an auditory sense of rhythm, first metered by the necessary cadence between light and dark, but sustains all biological activity. Perhaps this interiorization is what Milken meant when he wrote in his Domino Elegies, Earth, is it not this that you want? To rise invisibly in us? Is that not your dream? To be invisible one day? Gebser reminds us that the coherency between inner time and the soul suggests they are both preforms of matter that share energy, a potency that holds the tangible within the intangible. It surges itself in the event of world becoming, felt in the simultaneous creative nature of human soul making. Landa Post's description of the weather maker is a precise picture of mythical awareness at work. Being inside everything makes it simultaneously the world that contains everything. And from this, the concept of space virgins as an outer aspect of an inner state created at will. The concretization of the mythical is the conscious act of situating. And what is unexpected from the mythical imaginary is that the energy of concretized imagination leads to essence, not concrete pictures, to insight into completely new situations. This is the dynamic mercurial aspect of nature as potency, as creative intensity. In the mythical structure, truth does not speak, it does. It is this potency of the concretized mythical structure actuated externally. But how am I to experience this in a way that is free from the inner boundary of my own imagination and the outer boundary of my mental rationalizations? I go to the obstructions of my illness, shortened by the hypersensation of a dry, cold chill of air blowing over lungs that shudder at invasion. I cannot take in a full breath just as I cannot fall into a deep sleep. Existing by a small breath of minimal wind, you are in between the rise and fall, yearning for that lost intimacy of going all the way, of taking the full retreat and rushing back out to let it all go. The full exhale, the conscious return, fully restored of deep rest. But no, the satisfaction is not possible. Not the stretch and surge of replenished blood, not the alertness of an unencumbered moment. It is the hottest summer yet in Florida. For the last few years, we are each time experiencing the hottest summer ever recorded. Even despite the humid climate, I face a continuous desiccating breeze, shriveling what is inside. Like it keeps flapping on an old flag until it frays, unraveling a cough in a terrible tickle 
that anchors itself all the way down to the stomach. And strangely, in another opposition, my own thick, wet mucus grows, concentrates itself in hard units to attack something from outside. In the beginning, there was something, a harsh invasion of chemicals. That is long gone. But the habit of defense perpetuates itself. What is happening at the boundary, on the frontier? The edges are changing into an open field. The body of the atmosphere extends from dense to rarefied, dissolving into boundless. And boundless is where it begins, I think, with the weight of the atmosphere pressing into me. We should all be flattened onto the earth by the heaviness of air. If we were to stand inside a standard high school gym, the weight of the total volume of air above us would feel as heavy as an elephant. But no, not only are we spared the crush, we are oblivious to the weight. And that is because we have counterweight, our own internal pressure that pushes back in a well-matched tussle for equilibrium. Yet the minute pressure differences keep us alive. A slight lowering of pressure in our lungs draws us on the air, on the air, making it rush in. Like now, it rushes in faster than we can manage. I hear it like it's twisting through a big shell, resonating with those deep sounds imagined coming out of the ocean. Far the sound is traveled, I really don't know. Nevertheless, when you are still paying attention, you can hear a long way. Sound, too, exerts pressure, what we call decibels, where the force of which sound waves moving through air push against you like tides lapping against a rock in the sea. Sound connects virtually all of biological life. rhythm of breath is not purely repetitive. Something changes in the process. There is constant regeneration. It is like the medieval Persian story from La Vigena called the Crimson Angel, where a pilgrim meets a stranger at the base of the mountain who has just come down from the invisible plains above. He asks the stranger what road he took to pass through the supersensible boundary. And the stranger replies, Describe the journey, but not show the way. The road will always take you back to the same place. But the trick of it is, do not return to the same self. The key is to listen to what comes back from the home. The avant-garde poet Charles Olson understood this critical connectivity between our call and response while listening to our reality. He said, it comes to this. A man conceives his relation to nature. He is contained within his nature as he is participant in a larger force. He will be able to listen. And his hearing through himself will give him secrets, objects, shape. And by an inverse law, his shapes will make their own way. This is not easy. Shapes are something made in the body in the listening and calling in our relation to nature, such that, in the words of Mamie Bursenbrugge, 
things within telling my thoughts. This interpenetrating resonance is a striving that we find with Goethe's classic character, Faust, who bargains with the devil to not see the powers of nature. Goethe maintains there is an identity between human spirit and the informing spirit of nature, both wherein speaks one spirit to another. And as Olson shares, for the poet, this identity exists in the breathing of the one who writes as well as listens. Evelyn Glennie, a deaf musician, talks about how the way we breathe is a fundamental part of who we are. And that, she says, is an essential sound element. It's all about living. As we train our breathing, we train to live. Our own particular breathing entrains and shapes us physically, modulating our posture, our gaze, a degree of our openness, the movement of our attention, between what is happening to our body and what occurs outside our skin, our sensory awareness. Here in my own disruption, another sound element from the act of breathing occurs, the intervals of me. Staccato breath and sounds, sound forms of coughing take hold of something from the inside. Ill me, or is it ill, or does it I ill? The very word ill has unknown origin. We know it means morally evil, difficult, unwell, and in the old English, stingy. Ill holds back, not wanting to give or share. I am breathed by the pressure of being here. You may be pushed and bounce, but the bounce is slack, obstructed by a fine net. Will not return and do a play. Like thunder in my name. I stay vertical. If I lay flat, I fall into an interminable choke. Gasping erases everything. The moving world freezes. You start to be very attentive to the throat as obstruction and bridge the draw air. Nothing else matters. You become so focused that your face extends itself and crawls inside the mouth, slides down the throat, and covers the lungs. You yourself become the matter of vital importance. What are you facing? You clutch yourself, afraid to let go, to give in. The bronchial branching patterns, like claws, pierce through the body so deeply they grab hold of the walls of the room and somehow anchor me into my physical space so I don't get pulled away, drawn out by the atmosphere that wants to burn me. Winds travel across the Atlantic. I breathe the North African desert, accumulating through the effects of Florida, all a particle confusion, black carbon, calcium, road dust, burning fossil fuels, coal burning and diesel emissions, just plain soot, heavy metals, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, dust storms, construction and demolition, mining operations, and agriculture, the cement quarries and mixing, tires and road wear, bacteria and pollen and mold and plant and animal debris and bodies incinerated. <laughs> it blows, moves, and corners, stays and settles. Run your hand through the air as if it were water. Make a wave. The air moves with currents. Its own added flow, circling into eddies, a small diurnal variation in pressure caused by the atmosphere of tides. Wherever it appears, even inside us, two currents in opposite direction, we are carried into it, swimming inside our body. And sometimes it seems there is drought. There is a mystery in the building of atmosphere. Perhaps we did generate it by first need, the first living organism, outbreathing our great flexible shell, our origin, always changing, the great incubator loosely seeing Earth. And yet, we are formed inwardly in whiteness. Our lungs are the last organ to find form in the womb. At eight months, they finally soften the surfactants that reduce surface tension. 
malleable quivering of in and out, now puzzle with underlaps. My lungs resist. They are not breathed by the outside. They wait heavy at the point of emptiness, at this place, the end of a full exhale. Here we can rest for a few moments. Seconds to enjoy the pressing together. My warmth melting and evaporating solids. Breath is wet as vapor. I crave more moisture and breath over cups of hot water, always in a state of interpenetrating evaporation and compensation. This place where I am, Central Florida, urges towards the tropics, but is inevitably pulled by the greater opposing forces, the dry, cold winters and blistering hot wet summers. The plants are tough here, living best under the extended canopy of live oaks, some shelter from this mercurial strangeness. And a climate that bears no sweet odors, I am made down and penetrated with the smells of barley swamp and still air, algae breathing gas upward of warm, decomposing mud. I keep waiting for its conclusion. The cycle to end, but I am arrested through the interminable chaos. Levity of those in gravity in matter mutuous organization. I open my mouth just as I open my eyes and light enters. So here, the sharp weaving planes crossing from all directions, matters form. Can I listen to the light coming inside? Are there processes performed? Breathless. Most of the time, we don't know what we are hearing, or even that we are hearing, but somewhere sound goes. Ears breathe too. The tympanic membrane vibrates with every breath we take. Barometric pressure too pushes against the inner ear. It is possible to hear the advance coming and going of a storm. Just plunge into water or climb a mountain. Feel how we are an instrument or a talent. In my dreams, I breathe underwater like a fish. I draw air through the wet rattle. But first, always, the question, how is this possible? How am I getting air out of the water? Then the unquestioning, or the physical undoing, breathing deeper into accepting the dream nonsense, or no, with no physical sensory, no elements, no barometric pressure. For Olson, to participate in this resonance of consciousness, we have to be reverent. Reverence is the location of deeper listening. Quote, nature works from reverence even in its destructions as species go down with a crash. What does he mean by this? There is a certain disposition here, an ordering of attention. Wordsworth provides us a clue in his statement that the cell of hearing is dark and blind. Our organs of hearing and of vision lay elsewhere. There is an implied distance in communication here. The early 20th century phenomenologist Edmund Husserl speaks about this with regard to passivity and alterity. He writes, quote, the sound waves that I generate traverse my body, at the same time travel through external space before they reach my ears. My body is an imperfectly constituted thing, separated between the lived body and the thin body. On the one hand, my body is that from which I cannot distance myself. On the other hand, my body is that to which I cannot get close enough because my grasp of it is always unsure. I find the statement very important, for it is like the reciprocal of Andrew Post's wedding maker. I do not experience it as a self-objectification, but as a necessarily incomplete embodiment, some distant striving by that which is our alien, or perhaps I can say the spirit of our materiality, for a complete, for a complete consumption and digestion. In some way, the clouds make us. 
the circle continues. In its ownness, the body is always traversed by alienness. This is not a deficit, but the mark of the openness of the constitutive process. The body is the turning point, connecting nature and spirit, the world and self. It's not that I have an inner body in addition to my outer body. The body mediates between the self and the world by allowing the inner and outer, the same and the other, to pass over into one another. Embodiment actualizes two-way traffic across the frontier between the <clears throat> world. Husserl's alienness has its own familiarity outside of nature's elemental compulsions. This alienness, the unknown blind spots crossing over us all the time, speak us and understand this alien self crossing through as part of our rhythms, contributing to our internal qualitative time element. Yes, he talks about how we each have our own specific qualitative time element that we contribute to our existence, that shapes us. This is expressed qualitatively in the fourth dimension. The shaping consists of physiological changes that accompany this insight or potency of time. But unlike intuition that senses, insight engages deep into our own material. I think this is another way to explain Goethe's intrinsic potential. It is a generated force that nature's ceaseless movement into form. To conclude, we can say this intrinsic potentiality, this origin of life, is the intimation of nature's recessive presence. Maybe even the psychic alien presence beyond nature responsible for the continuous self-exceeding by which, as Robert Harrison says so well, I can't say it better, so I've been with his words, we burst forth from the lifeless and ecstatically maintain ourselves in being through expenditures that increase rather than deplete the reserves of vitality. Life is an excess Call it the self ecstasy matter. We have time for a couple of questions, especially for some questions. Um, thank you. That was brilliant and beautifully rendered. Thank you. Um, I, I was really struck by your dream of uh, the dreaming you are breathing in the, in the ocean. Yeah, and and, you the water a long time. Yeah, yeah, and it made me think of the of the of the ancient <coughs> connection between the lungs and the tides of the ocean. So our we're the microcosm of the macrocosm. We have everything. We have the water, we have the bones that are the rocks of Earth. We have the, but our, our lungs are connected to the tides and the way that they move in and out. Um, so I just wonder if that infused your tree. Well, I, I think I'm a fish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mm. Um, I understand that breathing, uh, by the way, I have to scan the chant, but not even close to you. You have more chant. Breathing has a lot to do with conspiracy. It leads to, to conspire. Yes, and uh, <coughs> the idea of breathing together to inspire. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just wondering if you have included or thought about the idea of conspiracy or breathing together. Just, mm -hmm. just what I'm saying. It makes very interesting. Um, in Egyptian mythology, Isis actually brought or asked for two goddess who came down to ease with her to give air, to give life, to, to conspire, to resurrect 
was that guy's idea. Egyptian. Yeah, I, I, the, the we have such a big we have such reverence for air because we need to have reverence to stay alive. Um, but I can't, I, my, it doesn't exist in me. Um, I gotta be honest, right? If I, if I wanna be real in what I'm doing, living my life, I have to be honest. And it, sometimes you feel embarrassed to be honest. But, um, you know, Kriya Yoga, which is not for everybody, maybe four people in the history of humankind. Um, in Kriya Yoga, the whole idea of air, air imprisons the human being. And the whole the yogis, the, those who have succeeded, have been able to remove their existence from the necessity of air. Um, and the fact that even that we have this example to conceptualize. I think everything we conceptualize, as, as the abstract reports to it, materializes in the substance of our physicality. So the fact that we can even conceptualize that is very dangerous. Yeah. So, so I, I'm, I'm really working personally. I don't have any answers, but I have like a lot of like real things that rise up that are survival, you know, questions of survival when it comes to the elements that we're living and how we really relate to them. So we must be really hungry right now. <laughs> we need to survive on the elements, right? <coughs> we have a, a reservation between 7 and 7.15 at the Cafe Press, and that is just around the corner on Madison Street. Well, 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 Madison, just before Madison. The best, yeah. the best way to get there would be to just walk out the front door of the student center then walk along the campus, go straight ahead, <coughs> so you come to the beautiful chapel. As soon as you're at the chapel, go beyond it, and then turn the road right behind the chapel. You take a right there, and then we'll be right on 12th on your left. Mm -hmm.